Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever it is, wherever you are. I'm Austin Titchener from the Reduced Shakespeare Company. And I'm Gary Andrews, otherwise known as Gary Scribbler from the internet. <laughs> and, and today we are joined by a distinguished uh, scholar of Shakespeare, I'm, I'm going to introduce him first and then let him tell him, tell us what his title is because I'll just cock it up. Uh, here he is, the wonderfully Shakespeareanly named Michael Whitmore, <laughs> director of the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. And it now occurs to me, my boss in a certain way. <laughs> because I write, I create, I, I write these Outrageous. monthly. Oh no, Austin, I serve you. My institution, my institution, which I'm lucky enough to lead, has the largest Shakespeare collection in the world, and it's sit there right atop Capitol Hill. But we serve scholars, we present work to the public, we try to interpret this work, but I think we, we always feel like we're working in support of people who want to engage with this writer, so that's you. Well, thank you, and but but I do write a monthly essay for the Folgers Shakespeare and Beyond blog, and it's a honestly it's an honor and a privilege that and uh, I have ooh I have an essay due in five days, so let's get this conversation get going. On it. Yeah, but seriously, on it. what are you doing talking to me? <laughs> well, we <laughs> want to talk to you because because as you said, what I love about the Folger is that and 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 you as well is that you in no matter you you embrace the idea that no matter no matter how one engages with Shakespeare, it is the right way. There are so many different ways to engage. Well, yeah, I mean it's hard for me to imagine a way that's wrong because I can't figure out a way that's right. Um, there are a lot of different ways of yeah. taking this writer's words or interpreting the stories or as you do, you you use them as inspiration to do something else and. You know, I just feel like that's the legacy of, of Shakespeare as a writer is that um, for some reason he's furnished us with something that, that um, different cultures, different groups can, and witty people like you can just take and, and turn into something else. But uh, he's, pretty, he's pretty available for that. And, uh, you know, it's great that you and others have figured out ways of just turning it around a bit. Well, it, it is, it's not only keeping him alive, but I, I realize he's at the root of all, almost, almost everything I have ever done theatrically. And sort, of, and sort of culturally, you know, every time we do our shows, which feature a lot of Shakespeare's greatest hits, you know, famous lines, et cetera, people come out and go and, and are surprised that they know as much Shakespeare as they do, because he's so much in our DNA, and we don't even, we don't even kind of really know that. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I, I used to study words with computers. I still do sometimes, but every one of Shakespeare's words has been put in a database. And so have about a billion words that were printed from between 16, seven, well, 1470 to maybe 1700. And you can actually compare them. But one of the things that's, that's really striking is that if you're a word or a phrase and you end up in Shakespeare's first folio, that's the 1623 collection of his works, your odds of being repeated in the English language go way, way up. Hmm. And I think that's because, you know, anybody can say something witty and, and, and it, it kind of lands and then it disappears. But if you attach it to a story that can be played again and again and again, that's the perfect dissemination mechanism for words. That, and that's it too, you, you hit on it, it's stories. It's not even his language. It's how he puts his language in the service of of stories that are still speaking to us all these years. Yeah, yeah no, I, I really agree with that. I, I feel like, uh, you know, many people will have the experiences that they read about or have seen in the plays. So if you're a teenager, um, you may go out on that balcony some night and you'll have to say something, you know, or, or if you're a person, uh, uh, let's say you're, you're a leader, you will have to, to figure out ways of of talking to people who are getting ready to do something hard. And, you know, like in Othello, sometimes you meet the person who can just whisper the things in your ears that you can't resist. And at some point, you know, you'll meet your Iago. I, I think that's a pretty, pretty broadly shared experience. And it's an important question. What will you do, right? I've never in a million years thought of that question, but you're absolutely right. What do you do 
when you meet your Iago? That's a fascinating question. Oh my gosh. Well, and, 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 and I was, I, I was going to say, I, you're talking about stories and in my distinguished library, these are all my Stephen King books, oh, not my, my not my Shakespeare books, but if I, but if I, I apologize for that, but if I do this and, and show you this from my upstairs uh, bookshelf. Oh my gosh, look at that. There they look are. All the Folger editions. All the Folger editions, the handsome Folger editions. Oh my gosh, those, the, you know, they're color coordinated there. You're really, what did they say that the, the Zoom bookshelf is the new status symbol? <laughs> you're really putting on the dog here you've really got those, those books out there um I, well, and i, I want to talk to you student, go ahead <laughs> no go ahead you had you were about to make a better point i'm no, about to make no. a go well i'm just looking over I, i've got some novels on the shelf down here i'm in my basement here on capitol hill i do have a very lovely bookshelf at the folger and of course underground um is a vault of about 22,000 linear feet of materials, uh, some of it quite rare, UNESCO World Heritage Treasures that are connected to Shakespeare's biography, documenting his life. But it's really an amazing collection. So uh, it's hard to be away from those books. But well, you know. and I think but before your tenure uh, at the Folger, uh, we were given a, a, a private viewing of the vaults, of your vaults, with all the folios and the, all the quartos. And I touched a folio and I liked it. It was so. <laughs> well, I, I, well, I'm sure it was under highly controlled circumstances, but it, it's, it's, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing, thing to be thing able, to able to show to that show. collection. And in the future, other people will be able to have a similar experience to the one you had because we're adding about 12,000 square feet of new public space. That's we're, very um, we're, we're uh, upgrading many of our spaces and creating wonderful new um, facilities for our researchers to continue to do their work. So it, it, we're, we're investing a lot in the mission of the Folger, but a big part of it will be to make that experience of seeing the folios, seeing quartos, seeing incredible works that document this period in history to see them and and to be able to interact with ink and old paper and you know really get your hands I, i'm i'm not sure that we were, were it's a great idea to have people touching a lot of first folios but i'm really convinced that giving people a sense of the touch and feel of really old books is kind of amazing especially in a world where this for many people is the only information sharing yeah. device but this device, and, and you can get Shakespeare on this device, is uh, not the first revolutionary media technology. The first truly revolutionary media technology was the printing press, which changed the way people thought about information. It changed the way they thought about the truth. And if Shakespeare had been born 100 years earlier, before the printing press had really come and um, become part of the life of London, his words would have just echoed in the globe and then they'd be gone. So yeah. it, it's kind of amazing that- um, The perfect storm of you know, him coming along at that point in time was uh, quite handy for all of us, really. Yeah, was, <laughs> he, was a, he was like a triple lightning strike, I think. Um, he was born and had a front seat at, at an incredible moment in history. You know, in early modern London, you're seeing all of the very large forces that are changing the world as it leaves the Middle Ages. So you're getting um, colonial expansion, you're getting commodities trade with, uh, with Europe, you're getting science, you're getting printing press and printed books, more people can read. Um, it's, it's a lot. And when I think about our time now, um, and that's just the first lightning strike, he was there at the right, other, at the right moment. He also turned out to have a fantastic year for stories too and three, an incredible way with words. So you just put those things together and uh, you've got a very, very rare talent and, and, and ability to talk about the world. As I think about the world we live in today um, and how complex it is, you know, Shakespeare was born and lived at a time of incredible disruption and change. And, and he also happened to be one of the most creative people that we know. And so that combination is really interesting. And as I 
as I think about the next hundred years of life around near the Folger, let's just say in the capital of the United States, um, you know, how are we going to find that next Shakespeare, you know, or, or, or that next, you know, deep thinker, and and that person will probably not look or sound anything like William Shakespeare. And the point is to find them because uh, we're gonna we we are certainly going to need another generation, two or three, of people who have something to say about this writer, um, and or have something important to say about what it's like to be a human being. And yeah. um, you know, for me, that's where the action is, and and that was why it was important to put this collection right next to the Supreme Court and. Um, <laughs> The capital, because to have to to have a democratic society, you have to have some understanding of what human beings do. Yeah, and you talk about the next uh, Shakespeare. Where would he, where would he or she come from? You know, I, I I would think if you were talking about a dramatic poet, he'd come from the theater, which you all which the Folger also embraces, because you have that marvelous Blackfriars Theater, which I hope is not being changed over much for the, during the renovation. Oh no. So all of our historic spaces, Austin, are landmarked. We actually landmarked some of the interior ones, but right. um, it's the first Elizabethan slash Tudor theater, permanent theater in North America. So 1932, they created a theater with two columns and uh, it's, it's kind of a mix of an in-yard theater. So there's audience around the stage, some, in, some up in a gallery and uh, the two column theater of the globe. But we have been performing in that space for decades. And it's, it's, very, it's very interesting to me to see the whole range of people who come uh, from school kids who are going to then perform on that stage in a festival to justices of the Supreme Court. You know, they're all looking for the same thing, which is that they, they would like to be delighted with play, but also to get you know, some insight or to yeah. learn something. Yeah. Um, uh, um, uh, and and I, I've seen a, a bunch of productions at the Folger that I wasn't uh, in, because uh, I've only been in two or three, but um, uh, but one of the stellar ones was the production of um, uh, Love's Labor's Lost, uh, directed by Vivian Banesh, that was not only fleet and funny, and way funnier than I ever expected that play to be, it also recreated the Folger reading room at one end of the building on the stage of the Folger Theater brilliantly and beautifully. So the library was the world of, of Love Labor's Lost. It was, it was glorious. It was such a clever move. I really loved that production. Um, yeah. you know, so the, a second historic space in the Folger is the Renaissance reading room, which um, it, it's modeled, I think, after an Oxford Cambridge college. But it's got some, it, it also has some church-like uh, features. It's got stained glass windows. It's a pretty interesting creation. Usually it's filled with scholars who are working through collection materials. But, we, but it, in, it, it has also become um, a theatrical space once the collection is stowed and, and, and the readers leave for the day we did do a, a, a performance piece called Confection, which was about food from a theater company called Third Rail in New York, which essentially staged these encounters throughout the reading room on balconies. We were able to do it safely, but it was, it was a great thing to realize that potentially um, every place in that building is theatrical. Mm. And, and it's, you know, we have a statue of Puck outside the building facing Congress. Um, <laughs> and and it, it says, oh, what fools these mortals be. But, uh, <laughs> purely you know, coincidental, of course. Purely coincidental with that. <laughs> well, so no, and then the, above it, the only, the only Shakespearean inscription on the outside of the building is a quotation from Love's Labor's Lost, which is, for wisdom's sake, which all men love. Mm. But... I think that's a great theatrical moment in Washington if after you've toured the Capitol and the Library of Congress and see, seen the Supreme Court, you then encounter this building, which tells the story of Shakespeare in the first folio in its design. But it also has got a, a, a pretty significant message for 
people who make our laws and people who interpret them, which is you, you're going to need certain, certain kind of wisdom to do that. And I think that's why that quotation is there. And then I think the puck inscription is important too, because it's saying, um, you know, as human beings, we are capable of just breathtaking stupidity, <laughs> arrogance, self-involvement. And um, you've got to recognize that and have a certain humility as you're about to be, you know, being part of public service. So I, I think it's completely intentional, yeah. the design of our building for that reason. Well, and, and you talk about um, Shakespeare as a, as a man of his time confronting uh, much change. And in the late 1590s, early 1600s, you know, there was, good, there was a transfer of power without for a while a clear successor. And he had written a lot of plays about civil wars as cautionary tales because there might be dissension and unrest. And we certainly seem to be appro approaching a very similar moment now. Yeah. Well, you know, boy, Austin, you touch on a, on a big topic, but now you ask me a serious question, so I have to give you um, a thoughtful answer, but I'm happy to I, do you, it. You're perfectly fine making a fart joke if you'd prefer. I, well, maybe later. Um, you know, the question of what makes a government legitimate is basic to any form of government in the, in the Jacobean Elizabethan period. There was a very clear theory about it. It's the reason why one person in their family has the right to rule the others is because God identifies them and they rule by divine right. And so there was a pretty well elaborated theory about why that should be the case. And in fact, King James even wrote about it uh, because he wanted people to believe it. And we live in a really different world. And, you know, so what makes our government legitimate? Well, it's based on the consent of, of people. And there's this big exercise, which is an election, and we have to go through it. And if it doesn't go right, and it doesn't happen according to the rules, then the person in charge can't claim to have any authority. And so, you know, I, I think this is really an interesting time because we're looking at that ritual and it's the ritual of the passage of power. And we're so aware of, of how important it is. And maybe that links us to the people when Shakespeare's writing in 1602, 1603, he's, you know, he's finished Hamlet. Maybe he's going to go back and revise it a little bit. And Elizabeth doesn't have a clear successor. And she's, Pardon me, she hasn't married anyone. So that's really something they need to work out. And the plays are full of moments where it's, you know, one of those Shakespearean questions is, how do you give away power? Mm. Really? How do you do and it? Do you? Like, and can you? Yeah. yeah can, could you do it? Can Richard yeah. II give it to Bolingbroke? Mm, no, maybe not. Maybe in yeah. the long term, that's, that didn't work. Uh, yeah. Lear trying to give it to his children. No, doesn't work. Um, the succession Claudius to Hamlet, uh, which Claudius identifies Hamlet, says, you're my elected, you know, I can't decide it for you. We're not a blood monarchy, but you have my voice. You're my successor. Shakespeare got really interested in the, the break points where power can or can't be transferred. And I think it's because he, he just lived through these moments and he knew how important it was. It's so cool. And you talked about the three points at which he he arrived at his moment in history the, the the a fourth one is that he helped create the industry that i work in <laughs> the theater industry you know where people pay money to mm -hmm. and then actors and playwrights and people get paid um and his theaters got shut down by plague our theaters have been shut down by plague yeah. their theater came back i'm hoping our theaters come back you know there's so many parallels Oh, and our course, of course our theaters will come back. Yeah. Um, it's so challenging. We have a theater company and we can't perform on our stage, partly because of our renovations, but also our partners where we were going to perform off stage, we can't do that. But I'm convinced, Austin, that people, it's just, it's basic to human beings to want to be in the same room with each other. And the special magic of the theater is, you know, I'm here, you're here, and we're listening to this person, and this is happening right now for us and only us. What an amazing thing. It's, uh, 
you can't reproduce it. And I think we really miss it. And I think we do too. And it's and 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 clearly there's a desire to to gather and assemble because nitwits are doing it even though it's not safe. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. So there's clearly that. Um, Gary, I've dominated uh, the questions so far. I was thinking of oh. veering towards the personal here. Is that cool with you? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Um, so we've talked a lot about the Folger, Michael, but I've also we're also dying to know how, how and when did you first drawing on Shakespeare? You showed us a little earlier. You have an electric guitar over there. Have you ever sung Shakespeare? Played Shakespeare? I know you grabbed my ukulele once, and the uh, yeah. twang on it brilliantly. <laughs> I think I played ukulele at the Folger Gala once, but um, well, for most of my early life, I thought I would be a musician. And um, I did get redirected though, because uh, in high school, I had a fantastic English. I actually didn't like Shakespeare when I encountered Shakespeare's plays in high, in earlier in my life. I just didn't work and I didn't take, but I read Othello with a really great um, high school English teacher, and it was that question that I shared with you a little earlier, you know, what do you do when you meet your Iago? Mm. And when you're a teenager, you you just have a lot of thoughts going through, you, you're your own worst Iago, I think. Um, yeah. and, I, and, I, and I think Shakespeare's really interested in that problem, but it was a really useful time for me to, to see the problem set out that way. And I did fall in love with the language. I just, I, I looked at the speeches and thought, oh, wow, you know, if you could stand and if you could think this fast and deliver this, this type of, if you could deliver this, you, you really, you have something. So I, I also was really attracted to the power of language and, and, you know, it really is a kind of power. And so I, I, some people really have it, writers have it. Some leaders have it, but I, for the rest of my life, I think I've been been trying to understand why words are so powerful. Well, and in our in that conversation, the, our podcast conversation, you said on your very first day, um, you were the first person to ask me why do I enjoy performing Shakespeare so much, and oh. it was I had never thought about the question until you asked me, mm -hmm. and I answered that for me, it's like um, a music. Speaking his words is like learning a musical instrument. It's a form of music. It's a language that I, 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 I'll never be perfect at it. And I own, but I own, keep wanting to get better at. The more I do it, the better I become. Well, isn't that true? It's with, with pretty much everything that's yes. hard. Um, you know, I, I was trained as a drummer, and then I changed to other instruments when I started living in places where you can't make a lot of noise. But. Uh, you know, in all cases, I love this about music too. It would be the same if we tried to learn Greek or Latin. There's, those are also really hard. Yeah. But, but you, you just have to put in a lot, a lot, a lot of time. And there's a reward to that. And then maybe, you know, there's certain people who are attracted to that challenge and, and, and need it uh, to that form of accomplishment. Maybe I'm that kind of person too, but I, I do, I do kind of enjoy the difficulty in the puzzle. There is also that enjoyment too, isn't there, of when you get a, a, a speech, a phrase, a, a, a role, um, that when you first look at it, you go, oh my goodness, this, and you, and you, how am I going to make this work? And then you go in and you take it apart and you put it together and then you get that moment when it clicks and it makes sense to you and then you say it and it makes sense to other people. That's, that's, that's a buzz that's very hard to sort of beat. And that moment of revelation is one of the great delights in performing it, I always find as well. But. Well, you guys are, are lucky because I, I mean, you know how to do that. I, I have never performed, I'm not an actor. I, I guess I did act the part of Elbow in college <laughs> in a production of Measure for Measure. Uh, and I, I had a hard time remembering my lines. But I'm sure you were the definitive elbow, sir. <laughs> I just remember chasing around balloons with a sword on stage. I, I really don't think I was that good, Austin. No. But uh, <laughs> but but I but I could see you know what good looks like, and and I get a chance to see that at the Folger, and and I still just I love seeing the plays. It's such yeah. a hard thing not to be able to see them now. It really it really is. Um, 
Oh, I was going to say something. I forget what it was. Oh no, I know what it was. It was, it was, you know, for years, decades, I've, I've known of the, 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 the speech from Macbeth, you know, life's but a walking shadow of a poor player. Strutting and strutting. And, uh, and it was really just a couple of days ago because I'm in this mood of Jesus, what are we going to do, <laughs> you know, in our current moment. And then I, and, and suddenly that speech came to me in a very simple kind of, Easy, God damn, life's but a walking shadow. Yeah. A, a tale told by an idiot. Oh my, I mean, it dropped into me in a way it never has. Yeah. Yeah, there's a moment like that in that film, Birdman. Um, I don't know if, you remember, if you've seen, it's an inner Ritu film. And the entire drum track is a drum solo by Antonio right. Sanchez, which is just a fantastic idea for a movie. But there's this beautiful, you know, Macbeth speech that drops in at a moment in, in that film. And it's like the filmmakers realizing what it means, the audience is realizing what it means, but it's an amazing that something could sit dormant for a long time. And then you think, oh, oh, that's, that's not it. And isn't it great that it's a Shakespeare speech used in that, in that film at that point to do that? You know, it's like, who else yeah. are you gonna turn to? <laughs> Yeah, well, and that's the great thing. That's the great thing about his plays and his stories too, because they don't change; you change. And so, the next time you come to them, they've changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I my favorite image, one of my favorite images from the plays, is when Festi um, is talking about Orsino, and he says something like, "Your mind is a very opal. Opal, it's it's changeable." and Shakespeare liked, there's a cluster of images around changeability. He also said it about taffeta, which is that fabric that reflects light in different ways. But I think there's something opalescent about his plays where you, you change, you just change position a little bit and a new inner fire comes out of them and, and suddenly it's a new color palette. And that's, I guess that's the best, I don't know, analogy for me about how, like why I'm attracted to his work is I'm just magnetized to that opalescence. I want to, I want to just turn it a little bit. And, and it feels like you can see so deeply into it. Like it must be a hundred miles deep. It's actually a very shallow light reflecting gem. Um, but I think Shakespeare knew that too. He was kind of, he was really interested in, in how do you create these effects that are like depth, even though it's a, a guy who's being paid to say words. <laughs> well, and what I'm discovering with uh, the various Zoom productions of Shakespeare that I'm seeing is that there's an intimacy to Shakespeare that gets lost in big outdoor Shakespeare productions that we all love going to. And um, what I'm just realizing about the Folger is that no matter which end of the building you're in, the library or the theater, you get to get up close to Shakespeare. You can look at his work in a folio. You can sit this close to live actors sweating and saying it. And you really get such, it, it changes so much to see Shakespeare up close and to really dive down deeply. Wow, that's really perceptive, Austin. I, I never thought to put it that way, but you're exactly right. And, and I do think we wanna get up close to these figures I mean, uh, here's another up close moment. Um, there's a portrait of Queen Elizabeth I called the Plimpton portrait at the Folger. And it's one of the portraits that was made from life of her. But here's the regal queen standing up with a sieve uh, and she's got that white face paint that she's using um, to amplify her presence and also I think to mystify who she is. You know, you, that's about as close as we'll get to her. Although we, we have these um, manuscript gift rolls, which are records of all the presents that she got from her <laughs> uh, very generous courtiers who had to give her gifts at the New Year, and, and which then records what they gave, and 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 then she gives them gifts. But she signed it, and you know, whenever I see those signatures, I think, wow, you know, this was a living person, and. You can imagine the complexity. The gift roll is, you know, meters. It's a, it's at least a meter and a half long. So, a lot of gifts, and you you can just imagine the complexity of this society of people trying to impress her. Some give her lace. This is a pretty intimate stuff that she gets. But they've all gonna get. They're all gonna show up and give her something. So, um, 
it's just amazing to 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 get a sense that that was all real at one point. Well, and 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 it, now I've just flashed into an idea of it's either it's a play or maybe it's just a sketch of her scribe, the guy who wrote down all the good. Really, we have to put this debt. Okay, it's not worth that much, is it? No, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> oh, yeah, and and it's it's pretty exact. I mean, she really kept she really watched it so um uh, the, being the, her scribe i'm sure was she's she's one of the most educated women in europe she's been trained by a humanist uh roger asham so she can read ancient languages she can write french poetry you know this is a pretty amazing education for a leader to have uh, i guess that's the advantage of monarchy is you know who's going to be in charge so you can start educating them early <laughs> right right um, it, it's it's a bit different now but that's a really good point oh and i i you know as we've been talking gary's been scribbling and i just i can't wait to see all that you've come up with gary <laughs> there's um, some nice images have been conjured in conversation which i'm trying to sort of go on. at the moment we're putting shakespeare under the microscope oh, oh very my good. gosh that's amazing i can't I, I just admire people who can make something of nothing <laughs> me too and you've got so many, I mean, you've got our friend Heather Wolf um, going there. Speaking of, speaking of putting Shakespeare under the microscope, she works with the original manuscripts and the, the, the flecks of DNA and dandruff and whatever that gets tucked in the crevices of these things. Yeah. And, and she, and she in, uh, 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 uncovered or translated, I forget which, some <laughs> evidence about his coat of arms. And you were talking about, uh, you were talking about status. You were talking about status symbols, uh, Michael, the, the Zoom background being a status symbol. I have to say, you're our first guest that we had to uh, schedule this, uh, this interview with through an assistant. And <laughs> as far as, uh, that's a, it's a measure of your greatness. But also, you know, Shakespeare wanted a coat of arms. It's All I want is an assistant, Michael. It's a measure of my dependence. <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, it, you know, we're in the middle of a capital campaign and a building renovation, so... I'd say, and a pandemic, so life is busy. But um, yeah, there's so many talented people at the Folger. Heather, Heather Wolf, our curator of manuscripts, uh, she discovered um, the uh, several instances of Shakespeare's coat of arms that had never been seen before. And, and you just gotta know that finding new material about William Shakespeare is a, an extraordinary and important thing because people have been looking for this material uh, for a long time. But, but what was so exciting about her discovery is the, the instance of the coat of arms that she found uh, named William Shakespeare, not the father, which is usually the case, but it also um, said player. And, and, and so that identifies the, the man from Stratford as the actor and it also does, it's, it is done in his lifetime, which, which is, there's sometimes been skepticism. Do we, could we really have a document that does that? Um, but that's also significant because when you put it, and she figured this out, uh, she's, if you look at, I think it's Stowe's Chronicles, there's a passage that says of, of the great, you know, writers present, um, William Shakespeare, gentlemen. Mm. Now, so when you put those two pieces, and what she figured out is if you put those two pieces of evidence together, then you've satisfied the skeptical ob objections to the case for William Shakespeare, the man from Stratford, also being the writer, mm -hmm. because uh, the, the objections that have been put up is we don't have any documents that identify the man from Stratford as the writer. And, and they're not you know, until we have that documentary evidence, it could have been a front. And so this is really <laughs> shuts the garage door, in, in my opinion, if there ever was room for, for serious debate. And, um, you know, it's because of a, a trained person who has seen hundreds and hundreds of coats of arms knows where to look. And, um, and, and she was also part of a team. We have a team at the Folger that we, for a project we called Project Dust Bunny. It also included Renata Mesmer, who's our head of conservation, um, and uh, um, a, a scientist from the NIH who helped sequence the, the DNA, Julia Segre, and, uh, and an archaeologist who helped identify Richard III. So 
all everybody came together and our question was, um, you know, the Richard the third identification happened because they were lucky and they dug in the right spot and then they actually, get, they weren't lucky, they researched it, but they actually got a physical sample of the, the body of the late Plantagenet King. And, and then they tested a survivor or a, a lineal descendant from that line uh, and they could get from a mouth swab mitochondrial DNA from a person and then they could do a match. So uh, mitochondrial DNA it's DNA from a small organelle within your cell and it's passed identically from mother to daughter. So it's very useful for making identifications. And I remember, you know, asking um, uh, the, the archeologist and well, wh why do you have to dig up the bodies when people interact with books, they just lean there over and they drop hair and skin cells in. Isn't that a pretty good storage system for DNA? especially when you close the book and put it on a cool shelf and leave it there for a couple of hundred years. And she said, you know, that, that might be a, a pretty easy way to get old DNA. <laughs> so Project Dust Bunny, uh, Heather Wolf and Renata Mesmer then took a cotton swab and ran it down the gutter of a 400 year old Bible and sent it to Julie Segre at the NIH. And um, she sequenced the DNA and she said, I, found the, I have found the haplotype of two individuals. Uh, probably they're from Northern Europe. Uh, I think they found acne on one of the skin cells. It's actually pretty common uh, to have that. And, and you know, it was so funny to me, just to geek out on this for, for a minute, um, the reason why an NIH scientist would be interested in getting old DNA is because we have become progressively um, resistant to antibiotics because they've been in our environment for so long. And, and the key to understanding antibiotic resistance would be to understand how human cells evolved alongside um, you know, what happened when we encountered that. So she wants pre-penicillin DNA. Right, and this would be a good way to get it. Um, so, and she happened to be an expert on skin cells. So, like, who who could have known? And, and but, but yeah, you know, working in a place that actually has the physical objects and being charged to care for them, I'd also, and you know, part of our responsibility is to interpret them. And interpretation can mean, you know, how did this object come to be? Who had it? What do the words in it mean? How can I appreciate it? But then also, what's in it? Physically, what's in it? And is there anything we could learn from that? That's, I, I love all that geeky stuff. That's fantastic. And, and I'll just say that in addition to Heather Wolf's uh, uh, academic uh, credentials and accomplishments, she is a marvelous straight woman. She played Margaret Dumont in one of our promo videos <laughs> where we presented William Shakespeare's long lost first play to her as an actual manuscript. Oh. And she, she reacted just the way she would if two idiots came in off the street. So what do you think? Well, first of all, the paper isn't right. It's not handmade rag paper, which is what it would have to be if it were from the 16th century. But that's not our fault. Yeah, no, no, no. I think if you if you go to the back, it says uh, 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 property of Ye Olde Office Depot. Um, yeah. The handwriting isn't right either. What's the um, matter with it? I, it's, it's not in secretary hand, which is the hand that Shakespeare no, would he, have used. He, he, no, he wrote it himself. He didn't use a secretary. Yeah. This is what we're telling well, you. No, so I mean the style of handwriting in the period is called secretary hand. It's not about whether or not Shakespeare had a secretary. I, 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 with respect, I, I don't know where you got your certification. Okay. But. Um, well, I think I need to um, end this discussion then because it's not, I mean, it's, I can't authenticate it. What you're, okay, so you're a scholar. What would you call it? I would call it um, a forgery. Yeah, great theory, guys. Um, well, you know, and a great curator has seen a lot of things and that's what makes them really good. That's also why uh, a lot of the theories about who Shakespeare was got kicked around for so long because the people, they were essentially clue hunters who were looking to prove something. Yeah. And they would, they would read like a transcription of a document that may or may not have been accurate. And then they would look at the words that, that they felt like were part of their case 
And when you have a curator whose job it is to see, buy, and take care of thousands of, of instances, you know, for example, Heather Wolf has seen hundreds and hundreds of instances of a, a coat of arms. And she knew enough when she saw a particular leaf with coat of arms to say, I can tell that this has been ripped from a larger manuscript. I know that manuscript exists. I'm going to go find it. You know, you can only, you can only do that if you've seen a lot of them. Yeah. And uh, same with signatures on wills, same. So you, it, context helps. And I, one of the things I feel really strongly about is our wonderful collection is there to inspire questions and, and one of the things the humanities can do for you, and, and it's a really hard thing to learn, is to realize that people thought differently about the same things a yeah. long time ago. And yeah. even just a word uh, like kin or kind in Hamlet, you know, well, how do we know what that word means? Well, now we go to the dictionary and just look it up. Well, how did the dictionary get created? Actually, someone read a whole lot of books from in the Oxford English Dictionary in the 17th century. You know, they'll tell you what this word meant a couple yeah. hundred years ago. And it's because they've read a lot of books. But um, just that one example of trying to understand what a word means, you really won't understand what that word means unless you've seen it used in a hundred sentences in a similar context. And just that one skill, you know, if we could give people that insight as part of their visit to the Folger, it would be huge. It's so much work as a college student to figure that one out, but you know, it's important. Mike, thank you so much for talking to us because it's always a delight and I miss seeing your face and I miss seeing everybody's face. And if I had to, if I had, could choose my own Shakespearean surname and it wasn't Charm Rogue, <laughs> I would like more. <laughs> okay, Charm Rogue. It's canon. It's canon. <laughs>